Um, so we're going to proceed now with our program, and it's um, honored now to welcome to the stage uh, Don Haas who is the Director of Teacher Programs at the Paleontological Research Institution and its Museum of the Earth and Cayuga Nature Center in Ithaca, New York. Don's work in public outreach, teacher education, teacher professional development, and curriculum material development marries deep understanding as to how people learn with deep understandings of the Earth system. He is past president of the National Association of Geoscience Teachers, a nationally regarded expert in climate and energy education, and he has led educator professional development programming throughout the United States. He is the co-author of books such as The Teacher-Friendly Guide to Climate Change, and he has served on the Earth and Space Science Design Team for the National Research Councils, a framework for K-12 science education, practices, cross-cutting concepts, and core ideas. Don has taught at Colgate Cornell and Michigan State Universities, the University at Buffalo, Kalamazoo College, and Tapestry and Norwich High Schools in New York. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Don Haas to the stage. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we're going to start off with that question and, and just kind of plant the seed now. Um, here's the actual block of graphite, pure carbon, couldn't afford diamonds. Um, and. Uh, here is the teacher-friendly guide to climate change, which I'll ask you folks to grab and pass around. Um, and that uh, was actually uh, written uh, with funding from a climatologist at uh, um, uh, Cornell and her National Science Foundation funded grant to study the carbon cycle, which we've been nicely talking about some this morning. Um, and that was Natalie Mahawald, and she is actually the lead writer of the one and a half degree uh, uh, report from IPCC. She's a member of the IPCC. Um, so, speaking of carbon, uh, this chunk is either has either three times as much carbon as in a gallon of gasoline, about the same amount as in a gallon of gasoline, or a third of the amount in a gallon of gasoline, and I'll um, come back to that later, but think about what your answer uh, to that question is. And I'm gonna flip between a few different uh, presentations um, and stitch together to make the hour. Uh, and we're gonna start with, it's too late, let's get to work anyway. Um, and, oh, I thought I had put a link in here to, to go to the other two parts which are down here. Um, the other two, so this part I think will take about 10 minutes. This is actually the first time I've, I've done this part in this way. Um, and then uh, where does gasoline go? We'll, we'll get you a little bit active in doing things with your balloons and your post-it notes and your tables so you won't be sitting the whole, the whole time. Um, and that'll probably take 20 minutes or a half an hour. And then fire and brimstone in Fort McMurray uh, We'll take another 15 or minute, minutes or so, and then um, I think we'll have some time for questions. Um, so, so um, there's been a lot of discussion and warnings that if we don't do X by X year, um, we're gonna be too late for various things. Well, the reality is um, we're already too late and we need to get to work anyway. Um, it's too late to prevent horrible consequences of climate change, and I'll also say I'm, I'm going to read mostly for this part, but in the middle part I won't do that. Um, but when it's too late is when we generally get to work. We ended slavery too late. Um, we stopped Hitler and his fascist allies too late. Um, for millions of um, people in Europe and, and uh, Americans as well and around the world. Uh, we got to work on civil rights and getting out of Vietnam too late. Being too late doesn't mean that it's too late to do something. It means we're already letting people suffer and die, um, but we can prevent some future suffering and death. Shit's getting real. Um, the fires in the Amazon, California, Africa, and in the Arctic bring, <laughs> bring to mind fire and brimstone, and we'll talk more about fire and brimstone in the course of the hour. This year's flooding on the Mississippi was also biblical in scale. 
I actually wrote this before the California fire season. Um, European heat waves this summer were killers. Um, I wrote this in August before Dorian um, had the most uh, intense sustained winds of any hurricane on record, I believe. I think it was, it was over 200 mile an hour sustained winds, which is just stunning to think about. And um, like I said, I wrote this before that happened. So somehow I had a hunch it might. Um, and um, it's also important to recognize that relying on, sorry about that, relying on K-12 education is too slow. Uh, if we rely on educating young people to address the climate emergency carried out in traditional ways, we'll be even more too late than we already are. So we must work in non-traditional ways. Some of that means helping our students to lead us. That means helping um, our students to be effective climate educators, communicators, and activists. They didn't make this mess and they shouldn't be responsible for dealing with it, but there's really no choice and we can help them lead government and corporate leadership to do what's right. Um, and of course, Greta Thun Thunberg is an inspiration. And very importantly, uh, following up on the paradigms discussion of uh, the last talk, uh, she breaks all the rules of schooling. Uh, she's teaching us by not going to school. She sees her Asperger's as a feature, not a bug. At 16, she's taking a stand and getting global attention for it. Like Greta, we have to break the rules of schooling to make the kinds of change we need. If we wish for a society to continue to thrive, we must redesign education to actually improve things on a broad scale. It must be highly interdisciplinary, build understandings of both nature, uh, both the nature of com complex systems and how systems change. This is poorly matched, the highly disciplinary, disciplinary nature of K-16 education, especially grades six through 16. Um, and this nice quote from Greta, the eyes of all future generations are upon you. And by you, she means me in part. If you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. We really ought to take those words to heart. Um, real problems are highly interdisciplinary. The, mo the issues that matter most in society, climate change, energy, water, soil, physical, mental health and health care, transportation, inequality, war and peace, agriculture, and our food system and human migration are all highly disciplinary in, in nature and can only be deeply understood from a systems perspective and schools suck at that. Point blank. <laughs> Uh, so, and a, a, a bald truth is that the uh, critical thinking capabilities of the average American have not improved in decades, at least not in any conspicuous way, despite the fact that we've spent billions of dollars trying to do that to improve the outcomes of schooling. The critical thinking capabilities of the average American are not better in any conspicuous way. If educational innovations improved outcomes on a broad scale, we'd be able to tell. People would be smarter. <laughs> People would not be doing a lot of the things that we are seeing on a national stage right now. Um, and uh, the most important part of education, I believe, is preparing people to meet their civic responsibilities, which of course includes college and career, but it includes so much more than that. Um, and to be clear, I am not speaking about test scores. <sighs> there are challenges embedded in these statements. We need to, I, I challenge you to identify a way that the average American is better at critical thinking in a utilitarian way than they were 40 years ago and to trace it to an innovation in education. I'm guessing you can't do that. Um, if you can't come up with it, um, that's both scaled up and improved outcomes, then work to change the system in big ways. Those are, that's a long-term thing, and we'll come back to long versus short-term um, short things. Important to note, though, the educational system is not broken. That's the wrong metaphor. It's highly resilient and self-replicating. It survives like nobody's business. That's not the sign of a healthy, an unhealthy system or a broken system. It's one that does something different from what we want it to do. Um, sweeping change in other systems, when we look across uh, 
retail, communications, energy, transportation. When we look across other systems, we find that sweeping change involves more than fixing some piece of the system. It involves replacing infrastructure and or technology with infrastructure and or technology of a fundamentally different sort. Rewriting educational standards is akin to rewriting user manuals. We confuse that with rewriting operating systems. It is not the same thing at all. It's like if Steve Jobs or Bill Gates sat down and wrote a new book. Would they be billionaires? Would they have become billionaires? I don't think so. They did something very, very different from that. And I ask you to imagine what the world would be like if the education system changed as much in the next 25 years as the communication system has changed in the last 25 years. The world would be a very, very different place. Here's a 4,000 year old classroom. It looks kind of like a modern classroom. Here's a beautiful meshing of a classroom from 1916 with one from 2016. And we could do the same sort of thing looking at a high school student or a college student's schedule. Virtually identical to not only 100 years ago, but probably 150 years ago. Um, even the course names would be the same. And the exam schedule and the semester schedule. That's all the same as it has been for 150 years or more. The oldest uh, well-established standardized testing system I think in the world is the New York State Regents exam system. That was approved by the New York, New York State Legislature in 1864 and the first exams were given in 1865 and my daughters in June of this year sat in a, a hot gym in June and did the same thing that people were doing 150 years ago. Where else do we do that in society? Uh, um, so, while we've changed the way we put information on the front walls of classrooms, we no longer write on a rock with a, piece, a different piece of rock. Um, almost everything else is the same as it has been for a very, very long time. And where else in society do we use the same basic technology of 4,000 years ago? So I've got two big asks. In the short term, we need to support the development of our students as climate educators, <coughs> communicators, and activists, and do so in, an in as interdisciplinary and systems-oriented way as we can within the current educational system. And in the longer term, we need to change that um, educational system. So that's part one is done. And now we're gonna switch back over to my chunk of graphite. And we're going to talk about some of the, that's, that's some of the social science, sort of, and philosophy maybe. Um, and now we're going to spend some time on the physical science and then we'll get back um, into the humanities after that. Um, so I'm, I'm still going to leave this hanging, but think about, think about it. I won't pass this around because graphite's the key uh, ingredient in pencil lead, so it does what pencil lead does. Um, so now we're going to look at gasoline and where does gasoline go and my goals for the, the hour are first to astonish you, and I, maybe we've done that a tiny bit with what we just talked about. Um, we'll do that some more in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, um, and scare you, and we've had a lot of that this morning, and we don't wanna leave it at that. Um, we, we're gonna close with uh, giving you some hope and some motivation to act. Um, so, looking at gasoline. Uh, Americans burn 391 million gasol gallons of gasoline on the average day. That's more than a gallon per person per day. There are about 330 million Americans. And by the way, I will share um, all of the presentation resources uh, so you don't have to um, take pictures unless you want to tweet them or something, which is great. Um, so more than a gallon per person per day uh, with 330 million Americans. That should give us pause. Um, and now we're going to get a little bit active. I'm going to throw around some big numbers and we need to think more carefully about big numbers than we generally do. Um, so we're going to talk about scale for a moment. Um, and in the back by the door there, um, you see that blue post-it note by the two doors, blue post-it notes by either doors. The one on the door that's open says zero on it. The one on the door that's closed says one trillion on it. And you've got post-it notes on your table. 
and I'm going to ask you to label, take three per person, and label them with 1,000, 1 million, and 1 billion, and then as quickly as we can, um, place your post-it notes between zero over there and a trillion over there where they go on, um, on the line. Does that make sense? Okay, so go back there and do your business with your post-it notes, 1,000, 1 million, and a billion between zero and a trillion. As quickly as you can. All right, there are a few people still back there, but I'm going to um, uh, advance us along here. Um, so there again is zero and a trillion. And um, near a trillion, there aren't very many post-it notes, but the rest of the way along that wall, um, about 30 feet, I, I measured it, the, the measure app on my, uh, my iPhone this morning. It's about 30, fe 30 feet between um, zero and a trillion there. Um, so a billion should be where? Pardon me? Pretty close to zero. About a third of an inch away from zero. <laughs> we should pause and think about that. And it's okay that you don't get that, but you need to start getting that, and you need to help your students get that. Um, for up until the time roughly that I was born, almost no one needed to know the difference between a thousand, a million, a billion, and a trillion. Now we do. It's not in our evolutionary programming. Um, somebody who was driving a horse and cart across um, the, uh, the plains of uh, America or whatever 150 years ago really didn't need to know that at all. And in fact, most people didn't need to know that pretty much until right now. Um, certainly in the, when we were coming out of Africa, nobody needed to know the difference between a thousand, a million, a billion, and a trillion. But now we, we really, really do. And um, we'll dig into why that is. You know, I'm starting with one of the reasons why that is, is to help us understand that idea of 391 million gallons of gasoline a day and 330 million Americans and 7.7 billion humans, something like that, is that about right? Um, somewhere in that ballpark. And understanding what those numbers mean, it, it turns out it is really quite important for understanding climate change and lots and lots of other things that actually matter a lot. Most controversial issues that we've dealt with we find that understanding scale is a big piece of it. So everything goes in the first one thousandth of that distance um, because, um, well, we can all pretty much picture a thousand reasonably well. My computer's probably worth about a thousand dollars. You might work in a school that has a thousand students and a million is a thousand thousand. And a billion is a thousand million and a trillion is a thousand billion. So again, when we look across that 30 foot length there, um, it's about a third of an inch to, uh, um, to equal one billion. And you can see what we did. Uh, we were mostly off by a factor of many, many times. If you put your, a billion at three inches, you're off by 10 times. If you put it at 30 inches from zero, you're off by a hundred times. And if we're making that scale of error routinely in our thinking, we need to get better. <laughs> um, and uh, like I said, hard to understand. A nice way of, of uh, illustrating it is to think about seconds. A thousand seconds is about 17 minutes. A million seconds is about 12 days. A billion seconds is about 32 years and a trillion seconds is 32,000 years. And humans have been around for less than 10 trillion seconds. Um, hum the Homo sapiens are somewhere on the order of, somewhere between 200,000 and 300,000 years old. Um, and the Earth is four and a half billion years old. So um, that uh, 32,000 years for a trillion seconds, that takes us to long before um, society and agriculture were established in, um, at any kind of scale anyway. So 
back to why we're thinking about big numbers. Americans burn 391 million gallons of gas a day, gasoline a day. A gallon of gas weighs a little over six pounds. Um, and I put a gallon jug that's a little more full than I intended because <laughs> I didn't, didn't let Matthew know that I needed one that was three quarters full. Um, so I filled up my glass and, and we brought it down some. Um, gasoline has a density about three quarters that of water. So if you've got a, a gallon jug that's three quarters full of water, then that's gonna give you the same heft in your hand as a gallon of gasoline would. That's gonna be close enough. If you wanna pour yourself out a little water into your glass, then we can bring it down to three quarters of um, a gallon. And I want you to pass that around to get a feel for a gallon of gasoline. Um, it weighs a little over six pounds. Um, so that means that if you're burning uh, 10 gallons of gasoline a week, then you're burning 60 pounds of gasoline and somehow at the end of the week, there's nothing in your tank anymore or 60 pounds is gone from your tank. Um, we of course know that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, only what? Changed in form or um, metamorphosed or something like that. Um, middle school science there. In order to understand the transformations we're talking about, it's helpful to know what uh, gasoline is. It's a complex mixture of hydrocarbons, and hydrocarbons are chemical compounds made out of hydrogen and carbon. On average, its chemical formula is something like C8H18. Um, C8H18 has a name. Anybody know what that is? Octane. octane. You see it on gas pumps all the time. And what do you get when you burn octane? Carbon dioxide and, and water, and energy, of course. Um, and we're gonna look at that in a cartoon uh, scheme here. Um, so here are some oxygen molecules or diatoms and an octane molecule. And we give it a spark and things recombine. Um, and this, by the way, is part of the reason that I'm using my own computer rather than one here is because Apple's Keynote makes very nice animations pretty easily, um, not so much on PowerPoint. Um, so there's our spark, and we've gone um, now, have, we ended up now with carbon dioxide molecules and water molecules. And when we look at these eight carbon dioxide molecules that we got from giving it that spark, we find that it weighs a bunch more than that octane molecule that we started with. And specifically, we can get into a little bit of the chemistry and say the molecular weight of carbon dioxide is 44 grams per mole. You multiply that by eight, you get 352. And the molecular weight of octane is 114. Um, so the resulting carbon dioxide um, weighs more than the uh, gasoline we started with. That's not magic. Um, it's because the reaction used oxygen from the air and not just the gasoline. So burning this six pound gallon of gasoline yields 19 pounds of carbon dioxide for every one of those 391 million gallons that we burn every day, which is about a quarter of US carbon emissions. So multiply these things by four if we wanna think about total emissions. So here come the balloons. Um, a gallon of gas is pretty easy to picture. Um, uh, it doesn't seem weird to think that it weighs about six pounds, and you've got a feel for that as it looks like the, my gallon jug has made it most of the way around. Um, but 19 pounds is something that's invisible and you can't smell it, you can't see it. Um, and it's, it's fine to breathe in as long as it's not bumping out uh, the oxygen um, at a high enough rate to asphyxiate you. Um, but thinking about that 19 pounds of an invisible gas is pretty hard to do. So. We're gonna think about it by using balloons and I neglected to bring myself one up here. Um, thank you. And there, if there aren't enough on the tables, there's plenty more on the, the center table up here in front. Um, so an inflated balloon weighs a little bit more than an empty one because the air and other gases inside it does weigh something. Um, so we wanna think about how many gallon sized balloons it takes to hold 19 pounds of carbon dioxide. So. Um, we're doing this, hold it empty, think about how much it weighs now, and fill it up so it's about the size of that jug. So 
So that's about the size of the jug. So you don't feel much of a difference in weight, <laughs> right? Uh, but there is a difference in weight. And if you've got a sense enough, sensitive enough scale, you can measure that. Um, but it, it's, it does weigh something more. So um, to help us think through this, and by the way, the strategy that I'm using now is called social mathematics, um, using uh, approaches with concrete things you can get your hands on or see to help you understand really big or really small numbers. Um, and I think that's a pretty important teaching strategy for um, bringing some messages home. Um, so what are some things that weigh about 19 pounds? A fat cat, my cat's about, my, my larger cat's about 16 pounds. I have had one that weighed 19 pounds in the past. Small dog, a one year old, 19 pounds, 19 pound weights. A few gallons, of, three gallons of water is pretty close. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, a barbell if you got a 20 pound um, barbell. Um, or uh, you know, a 20 pound bag of charcoal or bag of rice or or whatever, if, you've, if you buy things in bulk, then you probably have 20 pound bags of something. So how many balloons is it going to take to hold, and again, subtracting the weight of the balloon itself, and just thinking about the weight of the stuff inside it, how many balloons do you think it's gonna to take to hold 19 pounds of carbon dioxide? Lots and lots. 200? 200, 300, a trillion? Not a trillion. Um, it's uh, about 1,100, about 1,100, yeah. So we've got about 50 people in the, in the room, so each one of us would need to blow up uh, something like 22 balloons in order to give us the volume of carbon dioxide that, and mass roughly, um, although our breath isn't pure carbon dioxide, so it's not a perfect analogy. Um, but um, uh, we would each need to blow up about 22 balloons to get the volume of carbon dioxide gas that we get out of uh, burning one gallon of gasoline. So um, there goes 100 balloons. So do that 10 more times, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100. That's a lot of balloons from one gallon of gas. Um, and you can also think about other aspects of that mathematics. So we get 19 pounds of CO2 that has a volume of 1,100 gallons, which you, you uh, normally would convert to cubic feet or cubic centimeters or, or something. Um, but wow, um, 391 million times a day we do that in the US uh, for numbers for 2017. Uh, that's over seven billion pounds of CO2 produced every day just from burning gasoline. Multiply it again roughly by four to scale it up to total US emissions. And US emissions are now, I think on the order of 15% of global emissions. Um, so you can do the math from there. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, not yet. Hopefully they will. Um, it's complicated, of course, if you get your uh, um, electricity from coal, that's not very helpful. Um, and in Illinois, uh, do you know where uh, the biggest source of, what, what energy source is the largest for the state of El Illinois for generating electricity? Yeah. Nuclear. Yeah, it's nuclear. That makes Illinois pretty unusual. Most states, that's not true for. I believe Illinois is the largest generator of nuclear power in the country. What, what about the Trump administration lowering the standards on coal uh, on fuel? Uh... Well, as it turns out, um, coal companies are going, uh, there was just a bankruptcy to, uh, for Murray Energy, just declared bankruptcy two weeks ago or a week ago. Um, uh, it, regulating it at this point in time, uh, or deregulating it, I should say, isn't isn't having that much of an effect. Because the auto industry, where these standards which are yeah. out there, yeah. 
will be catastrophic. That, that has, yes, that is not a good, good thing. We'll come back to that, I think, but uh, um, for the sake of time, I'm going to shoot along. Um, oh, and I spilled my beans here. So um, if a gallon of gasoline is about 87% by weight, how does this compare to the amount of carbon in a gallon of gasoline? What do you think? I gave you three choices at the beginning. You remember what they were? So is this three times as much carbon, about the same amount of carbon, or a third of the amount of carbon in a gallon of gasoline? It's, it's about a third. It's about a third. Um, and that's because I made a mistake, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so there's five and a half pounds of carbon in a gallon of gas. Um, wow, uh, that's a lot for 391 million times a day. Um, and I um, uh, goofed here. Um, so I ordered a two by two by six inch block. I actually meant to order a six by six by two inch block. <laughs> so um, it should look like that. Um, for every single one of those 391 million gallons of gasoline, there's that much, there's three times this much carbon in it. Um, every day, 391 million times. So three times is the right answer. Or, um, three times the, the mass of this is the right answer. So if you wanna take that carbon back out of the, uh, out of the atmosphere, first off, the, the simplest thing to do technologically is to not put it there in the first place. And we don't talk about that nearly enough. We talk a, a lot about where our energy comes from when we talk about um, energy and climate. And I'll also throw out one of my favorite quotes on energy and climate uh, from Chris Hayes, who says that um, talking about energy without, or talking about climate without talking about energy is like talking about lung cancer without talking about smoking. Our climate problem is almost exclusively because of the way we get and use energy. Um, so we need to think very, very carefully about that. And the only truly environmentally friendly energy source is the one you don't use. When we talk an awful lot about um, what kind of energy we use, we don't talk nearly enough about how much energy we use. And I'm pretty certain that the real breakthroughs are going to come through ways that we figure out how to use less energy. And some of that is incredibly technologically simple. Ride your bike. <laughs> Don't live 50 miles from work. <laughs> um, things like that um, are a big, big piece of it. And that's, uh, but we'll come back to that too. So, um, but if we do put it into the air, the simplest thing to do uh, technologically to take it back out of the air is to plant trees. Um, Wood's about half carbon, 45 to 50% carbon. So if um, five and a half pounds of carbon goes into the air from burning each gallon of gasoline, how much wood do we need to grow? Go, we'll make the math simple and say that wood's half carbon. How much wood do we need to grow to take that carbon back out of the air? Roughly 11 pounds. So um, five and a half pounds, 50% of the wood is, um, carbon, so that'd be 11 pounds. So um, uh, that's to sequester each gallon of gasoline we burn. That's a lot of wood uh, per gallon. And um, we can't let that burner decay. So we have to put it someplace where it um, stays forever and ever, um, or uh, figure out a way to be neutral on that. And it just so happens that this weighs 11 pounds. So next time you fill up your tank, as you watch the gallons go by, say to yourself, two by four, two by four, two by four, two by four, two by four two by four, two by four, however many gallons it takes to fill your tank. That's how many two by fours you need to plant to grow, and not just plant, but to grow to offset each one of those gallons of gasoline. I will get to the hopeful part. 
not there yet. I'm hoping I've astonished you by now <laughs> and maybe scared you a little. Um, so uh, 390 million times two, uh, uh, two by fours a day means 4.3 billion pounds of wood grown every day. Are we doing that now? No. Um, that's more than one and a half trillion pounds of wood a year. Um, we need to, I, I believe it's roughly triple um, the amount of forested land in the US. The US is about 25% uh, um, forested and we need to go to about 75% forested to take out the carbon that we're putting in every year. That doesn't account for the carbon that we've added over the time period since the Industrial Revolution, almost the vast majority of which has been put in in the last 50 years or so. Um, and we can look at the stuff for coal and things too. Uh, but I'm going to change gears again and go to part three and talk about fire and brimstone um, and Fort McMurray. Uh, and uh, the subtitle is important. Um, did I ask how many English teachers we have? How many English teachers do we have? Um, just, a, just a few. Um, and uh, sitting on my table uh, is another book um, uh, underneath the uh, paper, I think. Um, I'll hold that up and I forget the exact title. Can you read that? Changing climate change to adolescence. Um, and the subtitle. Reading, writing, and making a difference. So that was jointly published by uh, Rutledge Press and the National Council of Teachers of English, who approved a uh, um, uh, position statement earlier this year on teaching climate change in the English class. Um, and the National Council for the Social Studies also, they haven't passed a position statement yet, but I, I hope at some point they'll start thinking about that. But they do have some resources out there. And um, uh, the uh, uh, National Congress for, uh, what's it called, Human Ecology, used to be HOMEC, um, is on sustainability next year in Atlanta. Um, so we can do this across the curriculum. It's better if we, we think about how to connect to one another, but it's, it's nice that there are resources out there across the curriculum. Um, this is drawing almost uh, directly from the Teacher-Friendly Guide to Climate Change, <clears throat> which I should say um, is full text free online um, at, uh, um, at that first uh, link, I believe is the right link. There's a different link that I use more now. I need to update that. Um, but I'm pretty sure that'll get you there. Um, and uh, again, I'll, sh I'll share links at the end that'll, that'll definitely get you there. It was written with funding from the National Science Foundation, so it's, it, we're able to make it free. And uh, the book from the Heartland Institute was mentioned earlier today. Uh, Heartland Institute being the uh, world's largest climate denial organization. How many of you got the book from them that's um, got a lie for a title? Why scientists disagree about climate change. Anybody in here get that? Just just one or two. Um, they sent it to 200,000 science teachers um, just as we were about to go to press um, with this book, and we said, "Oh, <laughs> our chapters were all laid out," and it was literally, I think, two weeks before we were going to go to press, and that hit the news, and we said, "Well, we need to do something, but we're not going to go back and redo the." page layouts and so forth. So we added an FAQ chapter uh, that addresses some of the things in the Heartland Institute book. And we said, if the Heartland Institute is gonna send their propaganda book um, to science teachers across the country, we're going to give those teachers a good resource as best we can. And we said, we're gonna do a crowdfunding campaign. And so far, we haven't gotten to Illinois yet, but we've raised enough money to send it to every public high school in 14 states. Um, and, <laughs> and some red states. And our largest contribution came from a conservative organization that wishes to remain anonymous because they accept climate change. And they, they gave us funding for six of those states. Um, so uh, not every conservative uh, is wrong about climate change, <laughs> just their leadership. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm gonna uh, fly by this. Uh, oop, I'm not gonna fly by that. Um, I'm gonna pause here and deputize you all as climate change communicators um, and invite you to do the same with your students um, that 
an interesting study came out earlier this year that showed that kids are pretty good at teaching their parents about climate change. And probably many of you won't be surprised that girls are better at it than boys. <laughs> um, uh, and if you Google something along those lines, you'll find it pretty quickly. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, but you should deputize your students as climate change communicators and get them thinking about it. Okay, now we're gonna talk about fire and brimstone. What does fire and brimstone bring to mind? Hell, hell and damnation, maybe hell on earth. Um, and think about how it informs the way you see the world and how it informs um, the way people who don't see the way, world the way you do see the world, um, including maybe some of your students. Um, so uh, quoting from the King James uh, Version of the Bible, um, in Revelation, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And there's a picture of a 400 year old picture or something like that of what uh, medieval artists thought fire and brimstone looked like. Um, and here is a different look at it. Biblical. What he means is Old Testament, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Real wrath of God type stuff. Exactly. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Enough, I get the point. <laughs> so, um, when I saw um, Fort McMurray's fires of, uh, in 2016, I thought of fire and brimstone. I don't, do any of you remember the fires in Fort McMurray in Alberta, Canada in 2016? Smoking yeah, yeah, so there you go. Um, so, oops. So looking at just a little bit of that, and I muted this one so we don't need sound on this. Um, uh, and this, was, this video actually came out during the evacuations. They ended up uh, evacuating 90,000 people, um, which is less than half of what was evacuated in California earlier um, this month, or last month. Um, but the biggest evacuation in Canadian history, the most expensive disaster in Canadian history, um, and stunning, started with uh, uh, forest fires burning in the Canadian Rockies in April. It is freakish that forest fires of substantial size were burning in April in the Canadian Rockies and burned it through May and into June and maybe even into July. Um, it was horrible. Um, and those four poor folks in Fort McMurray. Um, it's interesting too, and we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, and thinking about apocalyptic rhetoric, rhetoric, we use it a lot. And some of our favorite stories use apocalyptic rhetoric. Um, or some of our most told stories use apocalyptic rhetoric like the Lorax. Although this quote is not actually from the Lorax's mouth, but from the Wunzlers who said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better, it's not. Um, that was a pretty apocalyptic ending to that book. Um, and we've been telling apocalyptic stories as long as we've been telling stories. Um, and when we gather around the fire, some of those campfires uh, 200,000 years ago were surely apocalyptic ones. Um, and we use that kind of language when we talk about polarizing issues pretty regularly. And people at both poles in uh, the climate uh, debate um, talk about um, different kinds of apocalypse, apocalypses, either destruction of the environment or destruction of the economy, um, bringing down uh, the American way of life or uh, society or whatever. Um, and I don't think we're using those very, very thoughtfully an awful lot of the time. Um, and my goal here is to help us think about it more carefully. Uh, so recognizing some of the structure, apocalyptic stories involve prophecies. Uh, prophecies are predictions. Um, and while it's difficult, to link specific events to climate change. The drought that led to the fires in Fort McMurray aligns very much with what climate scientists predicted. Um, the uh, um, we're too late, uh, let's get to work anyway. I wrote that before, as I noted, before Dorian uh, had the uh, highest sustained winds of any hurricane in recorded history. Um, 
because I knew what climate scientists were predicting. And a couple of weeks after I wrote it, it came true. Um, I, I'm not calling myself a prophet. <laughs> Um, I'm saying that maybe is the case for climate scientists, um, but prophecies are more than um, predictions. Um, so who's who's got a good uh, religious literacy? What what else are prophecies besides predictions? I'm this. My grandfather was a preacher. Um, so prophecies also call for you to change your ways. They have a moral element to them. Um, uh, they ask you to repent, uh, not simply to apologize, but to behave in a fundamentally different way than what you were doing before. And in a pretty meaningful way, climate scientists are doing that too. Um, and here is Fort McMurray um, prior to the fires uh, in Google Earth. Uh, what's the big industry in Fort McMurray? Right. No, nope, but you're close. Tar sands or oil sands. Tar sands and oil sands are essentially synonymous. Um, so it's, it's energy industry, but it's not hydrofracking. It's refining, uh, it's extracting and refining tar sands or, or oil sands, which is kind of like asphalt, but naturally occurring. Um, and you turn that into oil in a pretty intensive, way, energy intensive way, and therefore uh, climate change intensive way of producing a barrel of oil. Um, and they've been doing that for a long time, and it's huge. Here's the 20 mile scale bar. So that is a gigantic operation, um, one of the largest such operations in the world. And, um, and when we zoom in, an interesting thing there is there's these yellow pyramids, which again are huge. 2000, there's the 2000 foot scale bar. So this is over, this is like 1,500 feet across or, you know, on the order of a quarter of a mile or something like that. And there are three of them. They are stories tall. This is the trailer of a tractor trailer. Um, what is that yellow stuff? It's a byproduct of, uh, ref um, of refining. Yeah, it's a by byproduct of refining the tar sands or the oil sands. Pardon me? No, nope. it is sulfur. What's an archaic name for sulfur? Brimstone, because <laughs> it forms on the brim of volcanoes. Um, so, so sulfur forms on the brim of some volcanoes, so therefore it's brimstone, and it is something that they're producing way more than they can sell um, in Fort McMurray. And if you've, if you've ever been to Vancouver, you may have seen huge piles of sulfur there too, because what they can sell, they, they run by rail over to uh, um, uh, um, wherever I just said, <laughs> and, um, and sell it. Now, um, Fort McMurray was but one recent disaster of biblical proportions. Um, so Baton Rouge in 2016 had some pretty impressive floods. Uh, 2017 hurricane season, in this picture there are uh, three hurricanes um, on, on screen there. Um, Buffalo's knife storm um, in November of a couple years ago. Uh, this is the city of Buffalo. This is the wall of lake effect clouds. Um, and this is someone's uh, door to the outside um, open to the, the snow packed up against it. Um, and it was called the knife storm because it formed a, a thin blade. Where I live in Amherst, New York, we got about two feet. Um, 10 miles to the south of me in Lancaster and West Seneca, they got seven feet um, in the course of uh, four days or something like that. It was actually two storms on top of one another. And 10 miles north of me, where my mom lived, they got about six inches. And 10 miles north of that, they got nothing. Um, so very weird lake effect snow. Lake effect snow is changing to some degree in uh, the climate uh, change world. And of course, California's 2017, 2018, 2019 fire seasons. I've added a, a year to that list um, each of the last three years since I first gave this presentation. Um, and um, that's not, however, to say that oil equals evil. And that's also a really quite important idea. Everything that we can see right now is here in some meaningful way because of fossil fuels. If one of you keeled over right now and we needed an ambulance, we would be very, very glad for fossil fuels. And I think it's really important to remember that. 
Fossil fuels are almost magical. Um, they made our modern way of life possible in a huge variety of ways. At the same time, they endanger our modern way of life. And I think it's really unfortunate that we don't talk about both of those things in the same conversation very much at all. Um, they're both true. And we should acknowledge both of those truths. Um, so, um, moving along. There are at least five reasons for exploring our use of this kind of rhetoric. Um, one is that the kind of story is very commonly used, and I don't think we pay enough attention to that, so we'll, I think we'll do better if we pay more attention. Uh, such approaches have uh, substantially different outcomes for people in the same audience. So you'll motivate some folks to work with you, some will simply tune it out, and others will actually be motivated to work against your goals. Um, and it's really important to recognize that if you've got more than two students in your class, you've got more than one audience. Um, and they will, behave, they will respond differently to whatever it is you do with them. Um, it's a good opportunity for making interdisciplinary connections. Um, it's a good opportunity for uh, building understanding and appreciation of complexity. And it's good to help us identify problematic claims. If an argument is grounded in a paradise past narrative, once upon a time everything was rosy, make America great again, um, or it promises a simple cure for multiple problems, or if it's grounded in a narrative of good and evil, uh, be suspicious. It might be right, but those are mythical structures that often are not uh, really grounded in what's going on. Um, some bottom lines, use apocalyptic framing very carefully or not at all. Um, but moral forming, uh, framing is still important and we're gonna spend our last few minutes looking at that. Um, so shifting gears once again, the end of the world has been prophesized for a very, very long time, but hasn't come to pass yet. That should give us some hope. We've always been wrong about the end of the world, at least at a global scale. Um, it's important to note that at regional scales, <laughs> there have been apocalypses. Um, and we live in wonderful, horrible times. Um, so now I'm gonna go back to reading a little bit more. Again, pretty much directly from the book. So, uh, teaching about climate change can be horribly depressing work. It seems as though we are marching headlong into hellish times and are not sufficiently rising to the challenge. This, to some degree, is the natural state of things. We have always lived in horrible times, if you look at it that way, which I tend to do, although since I've gotten divorced, it's been better. Um, <laughs> We've also always lived in marvelous times. Sometimes I can see that too, but reminders are helpful. When the situation becomes dire, as it seems to be doing now, we do have a history of rising to meet those ominous challenges. It is my hope that we are in the process of doing that now. As you mentioned, I think we're coming up on a tipping point. I'm, I'm been more optimistic about this in the last, in 2019 than I have been for a while. Uh, to consider the concept of wonderful, horrible times, I'm going to quickly step through five generations of my own family history. It's not the idea that you tell my family history, but use this as a model for thinking about something you might do. Um, my great-grandfather, Adget Loomis, was born in 1843 in Connecticut, and my great-grandmother, his wife, uh, Minnie, was born in 1847 in, in Ohio. Slavery was still firmly entrenched in the American South, and Adget and his brother Luth Lucius both fought for the Union Army, and Lucius died at the Andersonville prison camp. Clearly, these were horrible times. And there is my great-grandfather in his Union Army uniform, and my great-great-uncle uh, Lucius. Um, the Civil War ended, and my, uh, my great-grandfather marched in front of President Lincoln, and I like to pause and mention that uh, my mom knew her great her grandfather and my aunt who is still around and their cousin who is still around knew my great grandfather who marched in front of Abraham Lincoln which makes it so I'm two degrees of separation from somebody who marched in front of Abraham Lincoln and now you're three degrees of separation from somebody who marched in front of Abraham Lincoln it really wasn't that long ago um, horrible times were not over, but the abomination that was slavery did come to an end. Adget and Minnie married in 1871 and honeymooned in Niagara Falls. They went on to have five daughters and four sons and were married for more than 50 years. That's how my mom got to know them. Um, the brood included twins, Ruth and Ralph, born in 1891. Ralph was my grandfather. I don't know if his life or their life was wonderful, but it did have some wonderful outcomes. And there are my 
uh, grandparents on their honeymoon, great grandparents on their honeymoon across your eyes. You can see it in 3D. Um, virtual reality has been around for a while. Um, my grandfather also saw the tragedy of war, serving in a machine gunner's unit in World War I. He also saw pestilence helping to manage an impromptu hospital during the Spanish flu epidemic. His twin, Ruth, died as a young woman, probably suicide. But as these horrible things were going on, wonderful things were happening too. Nellie Brown, my grandmother, was one of the only women in the University of Missouri's Rocky Mountain Geologic Field Camp. And Grandpa went on to earn a master's degree in agricultural economics and then a divinity degree. As an extension agent, he was effective in helping bring an end to swine cholera. He married Nellie and they had four children, including twins of their own, Carolyn and Marilyn, my mother, who were born in 1931. And my grandparents were married for more than 50 years. Grandpa ma managed a dairy co-op and preached in several churches and returned to agricultural extension work for the University of Missouri in 1936. And Grandma taught physical geography and more. And there's my mom and her twin. And there's Adolf Hitler. Um, <laughs> and Hitler rose to power in Europe and the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, bringing the US into World War II. And my grandfather was fired from the extension as Quote, the extension didn't need any pacifists, remembering that he came by that honestly as a machine gunner in World War I. A few years later, my father, Roger, enlisted in the Navy, though fortunately the war was in its last year. He actually finished, um, or he was actually in Chicago at the Navy Pier at the end of World War II. Um, these were horrible times, but the war ended uh, and my dad served until just before the Korean War began. My folks met at the Univers University of Missouri, dad attending on the GI Bill. And there's Cleveland Cuyahoga, Cleveland's Cuyahoga River on fire again. It burned multiple times. It wasn't so long ago. Yeah, it wasn't so long ago. We're, you know, we're, we're progressing to the, to the now. Uh, and Jim Crow was still festering in the South and Joe McCarthy was feeding the Red Scare and rock and roll was coming up and life expectancy was growing and the skies were black with smoke and smog and rivers caught fire. And my parents married and had six kids beginning with, excuse me, um, beginning with my brother in 1952 and ending with me in 1963, just a few months before Kennedy was killed. And dad worked on technologies to see people through the forests of Southeast Asia, and my brothers worried about but were not called for the draft. And mom was a university librarian who wrote books about books, and Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy were killed in riots. And there was Woodstock and the Civil Rights Act and the Environmental Protection A Agency. They were wonderful, horrible times, and mom and dad were married for more than 50 years. And there's us. I'm the cute one. <laughs> uh, and Richard Nixon and Kent State and Free Love and Disco and the lakes and rivers got cleaner and the bald eagle came back. And eventually I got married and had two wonderful kids, Kiana born in 2001, just a few months before September 11th, and Nellie in 2004 as the country grew more and more mired in America's longest war. And there's the village people. <laughs> All along, we worried about the fate of our children in these turbulent times, whatever time it happened to be. All along, horrible things were happening that looked like the end of the world. And each time it looked like the end of the world, we did things to make it not be the end of the world. And OK, it never really looked like the end of the world, though it may have looked like the end of civilization. That doesn't need saving. This might. Most people are beautiful. Yes, horrible things are happening now. This was largely written in July of 2016 in the aftermath of a series of horrible shootings. And it looks to be an unending series of horrible shootings. But violent crime is actually at its lowest level in decades, which is pretty wonderful. And 2016 went down as the hottest year on record, which brought unprecedented droughts and floods and fires to various parts of the world, which is pretty horrible. And my daughters are kind. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> Hardworking, smart, happy, engaged in things that make the world a better place and beautiful. And hopefully your kids are too. And so are you. And there's 2016, um, which was the hottest year on record. 2018 was the fourth hottest behind 2017 and 2015. 2019 is on track to be in that top four. Last month was the hottest October on record globally, and it was the fourth month this year that that was true. Um, there are horrible things happening in the world right now. 
when the horror becomes clear to enough people, we do something about it to make it less horrible. Let's do that now and celebrate the wonderful things too. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how much time we have. Okay, we have some time for questions. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have a, I have an impression about when we are talking about a climate change, we are always addressing something horrible in our earth. But I mean, I'm just talking. We always address what about horrible world. Yeah. The world is horrible. Yeah. We are facing a lot of problem now. I think. Mm -hmm. But when I intended today, I just know do you have a conference here, and I just came in anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. So, but my question is only one thing. I like to, could you maybe can direct me the direction, mm -hmm. any kind of report or any kind of a books or anywhere website could look at, more like why we need to care about climate change so that we make our world better. I just want to see the positive side rather than, to me it sounds like a more religious, I, I'm teaching religion basically, mm -hmm. religious idealism to make you fear, to make you anger, make you feel you are living in a horrible time. But can you, any even scientific fact tell us when that climate change happened to us, when it, it, even if we can prevent that, what it makes it better? You, given that we're not living in Amazon, but I, I totally really respect the people living in Amazon yeah. and indigenous people. Now say that we're living in America. Well, um, so I mean, I'm sure it may, my, maybe my question doesn't make sense, but yeah. just, I, well, well, I'd just really like to know that. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly for the folks in California who have seen these horrible um, fire seasons year after year, it's, it's pretty blatantly horrible. Um, and uh, the hurricanes, um, while we can't uh, point to, um, we, we can't look at a hurricane, a hurricane typically and say this was caused by climate change. Um, that uh, is called attribution science, and it's getting better and better from year to year. Um, but one thing that, uh, a nice analogy for thinking about that is when we looked at Barry Bonds and A-Rod hitting home runs, we couldn't look at a home run and say, he hit that one because of um, his steroid use. But we could say that he was much more likely to hit a home run because of the steroid use. So the atmosphere is effectively on steroids. And it is um, changing every, everywhere around the globe in various ways. Um, I, I recently heard uh, a thing that maybe uh, a, a more applicable to uh, Buffalo and Chicago than other places in the country, but uh, the Farmer's Almanac, which I don't know about how accurate their predictions are, but they say expect um, the, this coming winter to be a polar coaster, um, which I like that label. <laughs> and we've seen that, uh, that um, some places are getting hotter, some places are getting colder in ways that are um, messing things up. And uh, I think one of the most important things to think about when thinking about climate change that we don't talk about all that much is that farming depends on a fairly stable climate. And the climate is changing in lots and lots of places. And that's having substantial effects for anyone who eats. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that's all of us. Um, so, uh, Chances are actually um, decent that Chicago and Buffalo will fare okay in the climate change regime. And will my crystal ball, which I don't know how much you should trust my crystal ball, but my crystal ball says that um, shrinking Rust Belt cities are going to see a reversal of their populations, uh, population trends um, because we're, we're overbuilt in terms of infrastructure and we've got good fresh water. Um, so I think we'll see people coming back up here, um, which will tax a lot of systems in a lot of ways and, and uh, um, you know, buy real estate <laughs> in the Rust Belt. Yes. So as a former resident of Miami, I went through yeah. several hurricanes. Can you, have other scientists tried to explain the 2005 hurricane season when the 
number of hurricanes was so big, they had to go into the Greek letters after the alphabet. Yeah. Well, um, you know, climate trends are, are looked at on a 30-year time scale. Um, so, and uh, 2005, we were already seeing uh, the effects. They're more pronounced now um, than they were then, but, uh, but they were already rolling along. Um, it's, uh, you know, another interesting piece that's kind of of the same vein is that I think it was 2017 when Australia had to add a color to their National Weather Service maps for being over um, uh, 35 degrees Fahrenheit, or uh, Celsius, I mean. Um, so like 120 degrees. I'm not as adept at that translation as I should be. But they, they got days so hot that the weather maps that they had been making for a very long time didn't accommodate that. Um, these changes are real and happening now and, and affecting real people that we know. I, I have a friend whose parents lost their um, house in one of the California fires last year, not this year. Um, and uh, Hurricane Sandy hit an awful lot of people I know um, across like seven states. Hi, uh, thanks again for that uh, presentation. I just had a quick question. Um, I'm a foreign language teacher, I teach French, mm -hmm. uh, and we are talking about sustainable energy and green energy. And the reason why I distinguish between the two is that in our readings, we have that, um, we discovered that uh, green energy is not necessarily sustainable in comparison to the demands of energy that we have in our society and that's produced by uh, nuclear reactors and so forth and so we're learning about eco communities such as like bed outside of london and so forth where there's sort of self-sufficient community solar panels and so and then of course there's the uh the green new deal and uh ways of promoting more green energy but how do we teach the students that green energy can work and in cases like you know, our dependence on, high dependence on, on energy and our need for nuclear energy can be also balanced with green energy or so forth. Um, I don't know how it would go about that. Um, yeah, that, there's an awful lot to that uh, question uh, that I could spend the rest of the afternoon on. Um, it, is, uh, it is very, very complex uh, with, a, again, a simple bottom line that uh, the only truly environmentally friendly energy is the energy you don't use. Um, but the uh, coal is no longer practical um, for it. no one's building coal plants in the United States and um, the orders for coal plants in China and India and, and so forth are um, falling off and, and several, um, several coal powered large coal energy developments around the world have been canceled because it doesn't make economic sense anymore because solar and wind have come down so, so much in price. Um, I don't, uh, let me see if I've actually got this open. Um, not that one. Yes, yeah, and um, you know, another uh, uh, mentioning Saudi Arabia reminds me of, um, I have too many tabs open in case you're wondering. Um, uh, one of my favorite lines is from a, soil, uh, a Saudi oil minister in, um, I don't see it. Oh, there it is, very bottom one. Um, in uh, the 1970s said, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> uh, the Oil Age is not going to end because we run out of oil. We have gotten increasingly more skilled at getting hard to get oil out of the ground. We are just not gonna run out. If we do, we're, we're terribly, terribly screwed in other ways. <laughs> um, but uh, um, uh, we're, we're changing our energy system incredibly rapidly. Um, we now get more electricity from natural gas than from uh, coal. That change happened a couple of years ago. Um, Texas is now the, bigger, the biggest producer of wind energy in terms of number of kilowatts. Um, New York, by the end of 2020, will get 0% of its electricity from coal. We're under 1% now. Um, and it was three or four years ago that we started getting more electricity from wind in New York State than from coal. Um, and uh, um, one of my favorite uh, political cartoons is from 
1860 something, I forget the exact date, um, where it's a, a drawing of a bunch of well, uh, whales having a fancy ball and the caption is, the whales celebrate the discovery of the oil wells in Pennsylvania. Um, <laughs> We have seen that over and over and over again, where we use up the, we find an energy source that's easy to get um, until we use most of it up, or the easy to get stores of it up, and then we go after something else. We've seen that happen all over the globe, all throughout Earth history, or all, all throughout human history, I should say. Um, uh, Holland rose to be a world power because they figured out what to do with peat to burn it, to get energy. And, they, and that um, you know, uh, created the tulip boom because they became wealthy enough to spend as much on a tulip as on a house. Um, and that didn't last terribly long. Um, while they were getting the peat out of the ground, they used up the stuff that was easy to get and uh, went after things that were harder and harder to get, more and more expensive to get, more and more environmentally damaging to get. Well, over in Great Britain, they were getting coal out of the ground and repeating that um, over and over and over again. And in the eastern seaboard of the US, we cut down all the trees 100 years ago or 150 years ago to use mostly for fuel, also for building um, and, uh, um, and, and so on. So that's a story that plays out over and over again throughout our history. 